All right. Hey everybody, it's 108 on the 26th of April, and I'm going to call this response to resistance meeting to order. Um, I'm going to introduce myself. I'm Tom Hackney. I'm the Director of Personnel and Professional Standards, and for the sake of record, I'll have the board introduce themselves as well, starting from my far left. That would be you, Lieutenant Felipe Alicia. Assistant Chief Lolita Smith. Lieutenant Brown. Assistant Chief Jackson Short. All right, so pro for that record. Um, so during these response to resistance boards, we have a floor lead and direct typically most of the questions through them. Uh, we'll each, each of us will have an opportunity to ask questions, but um, the floor lead, who's Lieutenant Brown, will, will primarily be the question asker. And uh, he's got some things to walk through, so I'll turn that over to him. Okay, so the first thing I want to do today is uh, prior to, to this hearing, you signed several forms. I just want to review them real quickly and just ensure that you signed them. Okay, officers, you signed the uh, Bill of Rights form, and that uh, that form is used for principal members, which you're considered principal members. Uh, even though there's no specific allegation of misconduct, we're doing an inquiry to see if there would be one. So you signed those forms. In, in that Bill of Rights form, it indicates certain things, such as the fact that you have the right to, to review all of the, uh, the, the, the documents and records associated with this case. Have both of you had the opportunity to look at everything? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. It also mentions you have a right to have a representative, which you both have uh, the FOP representative today, correct? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. You also signed the Administrative Proceeding Rights Form. That's the form that uh, explains that you are obligated to answer any of the questions that are asked of you with regards to this incident. Uh, you must uh, testify truthfully. Um, none of that information can be used against you criminally, but you are required to, to answer those questions. Do you have any questions on the Administrative Proceeding Rights Form? No, sir. Okay. And then finally, we have the sworn statement affidavit that you signed, and that simply indicates that the statements you're going to give today are under oath. Uh, you have to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. Uh, you've signed those, correct? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So I'm going to administer the oath now if you raise your right hand. You solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. I do. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to read a couple of things to you. The first thing I'm going to read is the confidentiality notice. So this is still an open case, and even when the board makes its recommendation at the end of this hearing, because the sheriff has to sign off on that, and because there could be some portion of it that goes to the Internal Affairs Unit for further investigation, it's not considered closed until a disposition is given, okay? So based on the current state of law, these proceedings are considered confidential and are not subject to disclosure until they become public record. Therefore, anyone participating in these proceedings is prohibited from willfully disclosing any information obtained during this process, including the nature of the questions asked, any information revealed, or documents furnished in connection with these proceedings until they become public record. So outside of your representative, you cannot discuss what happened in this hearing until after the case has been closed. Okay? Yes, sir. I'm also going to read the purpose of the RTR Review Board. As we know, these recordings are posted online and made available to the public. And so I'm going to explain why we have this Response to Resistance Review Board hearing. The Response to Resistance Review Board conducts administrative reviews of incidents involving certain uses of force by members of the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office. These reviews are conducted to ensure adherence to agency policy and training. And consistent with state and federal law, the Sheriff's Office affords substantial deference for the instantaneous judgment and decision making that must be used by law enforcement officers in certain situations. However, this deference does not permit any member to depart from agency policy, training, or professional standards of reasonableness. And since the ability to use force is such an extraordinary license given to law enforcement officers, the public looks to the sheriff's office to monitor and regulate these uses of force. And at today's hearing, this board will assess the appropriateness of the actions of all involved members based upon the facts and circumstances known to each member at the time of his or her decision to use force. All right, so I'll turn it over to Director Hackney for the rule of exclusion, which I don't believe we need to do so, right? Uh, since there are no witnesses, it's just two principles, there's no rule of exclusion, so you both will be here in the room during the testimony. And so what will happen now is we'll hear from the criminal investigator. Uh, she will present uh, the information that she learned, uh, after which we will then question each of you as the principal members, okay? So if the two of you go have a seat next to your representative and you can watch this presentation, all right? Thank you. Good morning, Detective. Good morning. State your name, ID number, and your assignment uh, as it relates to this case. I'm Margaret Radigan, ID number 7024. I'm assigned to the Homicide Cold Case Unit. 
and I'm the lead investigator on this incident. And being the lead criminal investigator, you've prepared a presentation that documents all of the facts and circumstances that you learned about with regards to this incident, correct? Yes, sir. Okay, and if you would proceed with that presentation now. Thank you. Thanks. This is the officer-involved incident that occurred in the 6600 block of San Juan Avenue on Monday, 8-14-2017 at 20:51 hours. The officers involved are Officer B.L. Jester, ID number 74972. He's assigned to the Community Problem Response Team, CPRT, Red Squad, and his date of employment is 11-3-2014. The other officer involved is Officer B.J. Langston, ID number 73721. He's also assigned to the Community Problem Response Team, Red Squad, and his date of employment is 1-27-2014. I have a summary prepared. On Monday, 8 14, 2017, at 2009 hours, Jacksonville Sheriff's Office patrol officers were dispatched to 6925 Ortega Woods Drive, the woods of Ortega, in reference to a kidnapping and carjacking. The complainant advised that her 14 year old daughter was sitting in her vehicle in the parking lot when the suspect approached her, taking the vehicle with her in it. The complainant described her vehicle as a 2017 Chevrolet Impala with a personalized Florida State University tag. At 2012 hours, JSO dispatchers received a 911 call from a caller stating the victim of the kidnapping carjacking was located in the area of 5726 Ovella Road. Officers met with the victim and she told officers that she was sitting in her mother's car listening to music and talking on the phone. She said the suspect approached her pointing a gun at her and asking where the money was. The suspect made the victim move to the passenger side of the vehicle and he got in the driver's seat. He took the victim's cell phone and left the complex at a high rate of speed. Shortly thereafter, the suspect, suspect dropped her off near Searward Avenue and fled in the vehicle. The victim ran to a residence on Ovella Street asking for help. The victim described the suspect as a light-skinned black male wearing a red shirt, a military camo bandana covering his face, and he was armed with a handgun. The description of the suspect was broadcast to officers via the police radio. The vehicle's OnStar was activated and the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office was provided with the vehicle's locations, first at Niblick Drive and San Juan Avenue, and then at San Juan Avenue and Lane Avenue. Officers B.L. Jester, ID number 74972, and B.J. Langston, 73721, who were assigned to the Community Problem Response Team were at the JSO stop station located at London Town Apartments, 1591 Lane Avenue. Hearing the locations of the stolen vehicle, they advised dispatchers that they would be en route to that area. As officers Jester and Langston made the left turn onto San Juan Avenue from Lane Avenue, they observed the white Chevrolet Impala in the westbound lanes of San Juan Avenue. They notified dispatch that they located the vehicle. The Chevrolet Impala was stopped in traffic and they positioned their vehicles to prevent the suspect from fleeing. Officer Langston positioned his vehicle at the front and Officer Jester positioning his vehicle at the rear of the Chevrolet Impala. Both officers identified the driver as a white male wearing a red t-shirt. They observed the driver's door open and the suspect exit the vehicle armed with a semi-automatic handgun with an extended magazine. As the suspect began to flee from the vehicle, he pointed the firearm first in the direction of Officer Langston and then in the direction of Officer Jester. Fearing for their lives, Officer Langston and Officer Jester discharged their firearms at the suspect. The suspect collapsed in the roadway. The officers rendered aid to the suspect until JFRD personnel could arrive. The suspect was transported to UF Health where he died from his injuries. The next is a series of uh, radio transmissions um, starting from the dispatch of the, arm, or the carjacking. There was a 911 call that was placed by the 14 year old's mother. She did not witness the incident. This was relayed to her third hand, so we didn't provide that. So starting at the actual dispatch at 2009, a signal 30 kidnapping was dispatched. 14 year old victim, vehicle is a white Chevy Impala with Florida tag. Suspect Juliet 3 signal 30 just occurred. Plenty advice for 14 year old daughter with signal 30. Suspect left in a white Chevy Impala with a Florida tag of. I 
At 2012, dispatch advises the child is located at 5726 Ovella Road. 715, we're receiving an additional caller at 5726-5726 Ovella Road advising the 14-year-old is 1097 at that address. It does not appear at the 30 at this time. At 2013, description of suspect is a light-skinned black male, camo bandana, and red shirt. Advising the suspect was a light-skinned brother Mike, camo bandana, and a red shirt. 2014, dispatch advises suspect was signal zero, armed with a pistol. Juliet 368, advising the suspect was signal zero with a pistol. Uh, it sounds like he's now put her out of the vehicle at that Avella address, and the additional caller is a passerby. At 2049, dispatch advises OnStar is monitoring vehicle stationary at Nimblick and San Juan. Timbor OnStar called advising the vehicles at Niblick and San Juan. It's currently stationary. At 2050 and 13 seconds, 1604, Officer Langston advises that he and 1601, Jester, are close to that intersection. 1601 and I are going to be 1097 that intersection in about 30 seconds. Let you know. At 2050 and 20 seconds, dispatch advises that per OnStar, the vehicle is now traveling westbound towards San Juan and Hyde Park. Tampor, advising the vehicles now westbound towards Hyde Park and San Juan. On first place, an ignition block on it. If they turn it off, it won't turn back on. At 20.50 and 29 seconds, Officer Langston and Officer Jester are 1097, arrived at San Juan and Lane Avenue. Tempo, we're 1097 at San Juan and Lane. At 20.50 and 39 seconds, Officer Langston and Officer Jester locate the vehicle at San Juan and Lane Avenue. Jester, there it is. Uh, HQ 1604, we got the vehicle at San Juan Lane. At 20.51 and 2 seconds, 1604, Officer Langston advises 10.68, acute distress at Lane and San Juan, shots fired. HQ 1604, 1068, Lane and San Juan, shots fired. At 20.51 and 10 seconds, 1604, Officer Langston advised, advised that the, he and 1601, Officer Jester, shot one and again advises 1068. 1601 and I shot one, 1068, Lane and San Juan. The area was canvassed and a video, surveillance video from 6667 San Juan Avenue was located and it captures um, the suspect's vehicle, um, some traffic and then the suspect's vehicle and then the two officer vehicles as they come up on, on uh, San Juan from Lane. In the top right corner as the officers um, set up, you'll see some activity. Okay. The rest of the video goes on to capture um, officers arriving and, and fire rescue. Right, so do this. Walk us through what happened in that video. So we see that the two uh, police vehicles uh, with their lights, and they obviously did the U-turn. They're pulling up behind the suspect vehicle. Is that correct? That's correct. So okay. we have one vehicle pulling in towards the light, a second vehicle, and the third vehicle is going to be the Chevy Impala right here. Okay. You'll see our patrol officers coming from the right of the screen. First one's going to be Officer Jester, who's set up in the rear, and Officer Langston will come up to the front of the Impala. Emergency lights are activated. Based on okay. what was discovered later, was this a block of any sort or an attempt to, to, to stop the vehicle, or was it just a traffic stop? More to, to prevent him from going any further. Okay. 
And then what we're seeing up in that top right uh, of the screen is what was described as the shots fired. That's so, correct. Okay. So here are um, one of the two aerial shots um, from the scene. I get my corner for um, This is where 6667 San Juan, this is where the video was obtained um, that we just watched. This block here is where the um, two patrol cars and the Impala was located. The X is spray painted by the ET unit, Lane Avenue. Um, there was no video obtained at the church. The second video that we had um, was obtained here at 1966 Lane Avenue. It's a business. Um, the video is blocked by these trees here, or the actual scene. <coughs> what you see on that video is just the officers coming up to the light at Lane and San Juan and then making their left. It does not capture any of the, of the incident. And then this is just, uh, again, another aerial of the scene. Lane Avenue and San Juan. This is the positioning of the vehicles. Um, as we saw, they were positioning on the video. The lights, the emergency lights were um, turned off so we could take photographs without them uh, being obstructed. Um, this is going to be Officer Langston's vehicle and then Officer Jester's vehicle. It's another view of the patrol vehicles and also some evidence in the roadway. This is going to be the handgun of the suspect, some clothing, another view, suspect vehicle up against um, Officer Langston's um, front uh, passenger door, Officer Jester's front bumper against the rear bumper of the um, Chevy Impala, also the Florida State tag. This shot here is more of a somewhat perspective. Um, it'll show the suspect vehicle is, is open completely and Officer Jester's patrol light um, headlights are illuminating this doorway here. Also noted um, was the both interior dome lights of the suspect vehicle was, were on when he exited the vehicle, illuminating, illuminating that area. Another angle, this would be more of um, Officer Langston's um, view. Um, crime scene diagram, evidence items one through eight in this area here are going to be nine millimeter shell casings which would be consistent with Officer Jester standing. Items nine through 17, nine millimeter shell casings would be consistent with Officer Langston standing. A med kit is found here where there is a blood stain. Cigarette lighter is um, item number 19. And 20 through 24 in this area here are going to be some uh, fragments, bullet fragments. A red shirt was located, and 26 is going to be the suspect's Glock 9 millimeter. Crime scene photos again showing the 1 through 8 and the 9 through 17 suspect's gun. In this uh, photo here, again, the projectile items, the red shirt, and the med bag. Letters A through H show where there are actual bullet strikes in the roadway. Taking those out, those placards out, each bullet strike. This one is just off the screen, but it's by Flacker 24. Close up of the suspect's gun. Med bag, item number 18. And again, 20 through 25. And the big lighter, number 19. Inside the vehicle was a um, camouflage printed um, bandana. Our subject involved um, is going to be Robert Emmert Bracewell, date of birth 10-8 of 1996, 20 years of age at the time. His criminal history shows three felony convictions as juvenile, possession of a firearm by delinquent, armed burglary, and burglary. In 2016, he had a violation of probation for community control. 
This is a Facebook image that we were able to capture um, with him wearing that bandana. And another one. Medical examiner performed an autopsy on the decedent under 17-1727. Dr. Falsgraf performed the autopsy. Toxicology showed that he had marijuana in his system and did not have a blood alcohol. His cause of death was shown as multiple gunshot wounds of torso with a perforation of lungs and renal vessels, a total of 11 gunshots, and his manner of death, manner of death was ruled as a homicide. Suspect's firearm is a Glock Model 17, serial number X-ray Mike Papa 944, with an extended magazine. He had no live rounds in the, the chamber of the firearm, but 33 live rounds in the magazine. ATF trace done on the suspect's firearm, again showing it the Glock 17 9 millimeter, X-ray Mike Papa 944. Trace was, the firearm was traced to William David Griffiths of Elkton, Florida. Mr. Griffiths sold the firearm on arms list to Josh Turner. Mr. Turner sold the firearm to his brother Bradley Turner, who sold it to Colby Loftus on Facebook, approximately six months before the officer involved shooting. Cody Loftus advised that his gun had been stolen, but he had not reported it stolen. I did not find through any of our crime analysis um, searches whether there was a relationship between Cody and Mr. Brace. Inventory of the officer's gun, officer's jester's weapon inventory. His gun is a Glock Model 17, serial number TRL1HL Streamlight was attached. He had one live round in the chamber of his gun and nine rounds in the magazine. The total shots, eight shots fired. Officer Langston's weapon inventory, his gun is a Glock Model 34, serial number TRL1HL Streamlight was attached, one live round in the chamber and eight live rounds in the magazine with a total of nine shots fired. And this is the uh, letter from the state attorney's office dated on March 21st, 2019, stating that they reviewed the shooting and that they ruled it as a justifiable shooting under Florida law and they will follow with a more detailed report. Is there any prior knowledge of the suspect by the victim that you uncover when you conduct your investigation, or was this truly a stranger that was kidnapped? Truly a stranger. The community problem response team, the citywide CPR, as it's referred to, uh, do you know what their basic function is? Or can you explain what their basic function is? I know they're assigned citywide. I guess if there's um, certain problem areas in the city, high crime areas, they'll go focus on that. I believe that was one of the areas that they were in. Okay. During the 30 minutes in between when it was announced that the victim had been recovered uh, and then when officers Langston and Jester uh, explained that they were near the area where uh, OnStar said the vehicle was located, did officers respond and speak with the victim to get any sort of confirmation as to the description of the suspect? Is that what happened during that 30 minute period? That's exactly what happened. Yeah. Officers responded there uh, and interviewed her there and that's when they got the detailed description and including that firearm. Okay. And there were 11 true actual strikes uh, by the suspect, gun, gun, uh, gunshot strikes, and then we have, what, they have 17 total rounds fired, 11 yes. out of 17, correct? Yes, sir. I have no further questions. Uh, Lieutenant Lisu? No questions. Assistant Chief Smith? No. Assistant Chief Short? Did the bullet strikes on the ground tell us anything about the uh, officer shooting or the, vic the uh, suspect? The bullet strikes would show, let me refer back there real quick. Referring back to the actual, um, hold on. they're showing the trajectory, more of an angle, so as the suspect is running um, with the firearm after he's pointing it at the suspect or at the officers, um, they're not straight down, they're more at an angle. Um, there are a total of eight strikes to the ground. Um, some of the wounds to the suspect's bodies are through and through. Thank you. Director Hackney. Go back to the uh, medical examiner report. Just you know, a lot to go there on the, the screen. Just um, with 11 strikes, was the medical examiner able to determine that those were 11 
individual strikes or could those have been entry exit wounds or do you know? They were 11 strikes. Um, within those strikes, one wound would show an entry and exit, but they were not counted as separate. Okay, so there were 11. And did your investigation find any disparity with the evidence at the scene versus uh, statements provided by the officers? No, sir. Okay, I'll have you further. Thank you, Detective. We may call upon you to provide further clarification. Mm -hmm. But for now, we're going to call uh, Officer Jester and his representative. speak into the mic. We don't need it for amplification for the room, but we'll need it for the recording. So, officer, if you could just explain your, uh, tell us your name, ID number, your current assignment and the assignment uh, that you had on the night of the incident. My name is Officer Brandon Jester, ID number 74972. Uh, I've been employed with the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office since 2014. Uh, on the day of this incident, I was part of the community problem response team. Same squad. Okay, you take a second, please, to explain to us what the function of the community problem response team is. The community problem response unit is a citywide, countywide violent crimes task force, uh, intelligence based unit. We look at violent crime hotspots throughout the city, which are updated every quarter. And then we do proactive and sometimes covert police work in those high violent crime areas. And by proactive, I mean, as opposed to responding to calls for service, you're either looking for particular wanted persons, or you are uh, seeking to prevent crime from happening, correct? Yes, sir. Okay, in covert meaning, uh, assimilating it into a specific area, uh, pretending to be, you know, one among them so that you can surprise them with some sort of law enforcement action, correct? Yes, sir, that's okay. correct. So from your perspective, adding no details that you may have learned subsequent to what happened that night, walk us through uh, everything from your perspective that night, from the moment you got the call, or the moment you heard it, uh, the, the call go out on the radio, uh, all the way up to and including your conclusion, uh, your, your, your involvement of, uh, into the incident, okay? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, on August 14, 2017, between roughly 2040, which is 840 and 845 p.m., uh, I was at 1591 South Lane Avenue. 1591 South Lane Avenue at the time was the Community Problem Response Unit Red Squad office. So we would go there to do paperwork or, or eat dinner. Um, between 8.40 and 8.45 p.m. that night, Officer Wise, one of the officers on my squad, uh, alerted me and the rest of the squad on our OSS radio channel. It's the radio channel that our squad, CPR, uses. He told us that Zone 4 had just responded to, or was respond in the process of responding to an armed kidnapping and carjacking. Um, I went down from upstairs in the office, I went down to my patrol car, and I started looking up the call. I looked up the call so that I could start reading all the additional information in the call notes. Uh, when I started reading the call notes, uh, the information that I got at the time was that an armed kidnapping and carjacking had occurred at roughly uh, 8.09 that night. This is about 30 minutes before I'm going down to my car. Um, the suspect vehicle was a 2017 white Chevrolet Impala, and it had a Florida tag of, and it was a Florida State specialty tag. Um, I also read in the call notes that a couple minutes after the suspect had taken off with the victim, that he had kicked her out of the car on Avella Road. I'm not sure how far away that is, but he had kicked her out of the car. Um, there was a bolo put out for the suspect saying that he was a light-skinned black male and that he was wearing a camouflage bandana and a red shirt. Um, with that information, feeling a little bit like I, I knew a little bit more about the situation, um, I started monitoring Alpha 4 and Bravo 4 radio channels, and I heard that one of the officers, uh, patrol officers on the scene was actually on the, the phone with OnStar, and OnStar is just a... a basically a two-way communication system you know, where you can track a vehicle. Um, so the, uh, the officer on the phone with OnStar said that he was trying to get locations on the vehicle 
And at that time, this is when myself and Officer Langston both actually left the, the complex at 1591 South Lane Avenue. While we're driving, we pull out of the complex and start driving southbound on Lane Avenue. Um, when we start driving south and from 1591 until Lane and San Juan, it, it's roughly three quarters of a mile. It's less than a mile. Um, I'm in the front and Officer Langston's patrol vehicle is right behind mine. While we're driving southbound, uh, the officer on the phone with OnStar tells us that the vehicle is stationary at San Juan and Niblick. Um, as we're getting, that's when you hear Officer Langston get on the radio and say that we're, we're close to the area. Um, as we're continuing southbound on uh, Lane Avenue, uh, it goes, the update goes from being stationary to now the vehicle is mobile and it's moving westbound on San Juan, which as, as a reference, westbound on San Juan from Niblick would have been towards um, myself and Officer Langston. Um, as we approach the intersection of Lane and San Juan, I'm, I'm in the front still. I make a left-hand turn onto San Juan, and as soon as I make that left-hand turn, I see a 2017 white Chevrolet Impala. Um, I drive, it's driving westbound and I'm driving eastbound. So you can, you can kind of see in the video, the, the speeds are, are not fast, it's, it's slow. We're both going roughly 10 miles an hour. Uh, as I drive by the, the, the Chevrolet Impala, I turn around, do a U-turn, and I get directly behind the vehicle. This, this is the time that I can actually um, verify this is the right tag. It's Florida State specialty tag on the vehicle. Um, before I had turned around, I looked over my left shoulder um, to look at the light to see if the suspect was going to have a green light or if he was going to have a red light. You could see in the video that there's two there's two vehicles directly in front of him. The light at the time was red, and if you can you can see right there in the in the aerial shot. Choose your uh, pointer if you don't mind. Oh, sorry. That's good. It's this one. You can see right here, the suspect vehicle is in the right-hand lane. Uh, this is the traffic light right here. So this light is red, and there's two vehicles in front of him. So they're both, they both stop prior to making their right-hand turn. And the suspect, uh, suspect vehicle is going to be the third vehicle in line. So I knew, unless the suspect vehicle abruptly swerved around the other two vehicles, that he was going to be stuck there for just a second. Um, I made the U-turn. I got directly behind him. As, as um, at that time, Officer Langston, he made a U-turn as well, and he comes around my patrol vehicle like you can see in the video. Officer Langston positions his patrol vehicle at an angle um, directly in front of the kidnapping carjacking vehicle. At that time, the suspect actually, he actually puts the vehicle in reverse, and, and he, now he's coming towards my, my police vehicle. He puts it back in drive, and then he puts it in... Uh, reverse again and then puts it in drive again and you can kind of see in, in the video there's it almost looks like my car jumps when he puts it in drive that last time I actually I actually put my push bumper all the way into the the rear end of the vehicle um, as soon as I uh, as soon as I put the push bumper in the rear of the vehicle I put my vehicle in park uh, I put the emergency brake on and I jump out of my vehicle at the same time I'm jumping out of my ve vehicle the suspect is also jumping out of his vehicle. Um, he starts, he quickly starts to run. As soon as he jumps out of the vehicle and starts to run, um, I'll demonstrate this part. Come on this side of the tank, that thing's right here. This mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> okay, as the, as the suspect starts to run, I'm jumping out of my car and I'm starting, uh, I'm starting to run as well. When the suspect uh, jumps out of the car and as he goes to run, his right arm comes back like this. The, the firearm is in his right hand, and you can see from the uh, from the picture, it had uh, extended magazine. I think a, a 30 round magazine. So that was the, it was very distinguishable. The magazine was it was sticking all the way out here when his arm came back. Um, I saw that. Can we go to? Can you get my point of view?
Okay, so <clears throat> when this is my point of view, when he first gets out and starts to run, um, I, see the, I see the gun in his hand. Officer Langston is, is over here um, on this side of his police vehicle. So I had to wait. At this point, I'm drawing my firearm out of my holster. I have to wait until the suspect is, clears Officer Langston. As he clears Officer Langston, um, I hear a gunshot. And the first gunshot that I heard, I did not know if Officer Langston had shot the suspect or if the suspect had shot Officer Langston. Um, as he's run, he runs south into the roadway on San Juan, passing Officer Langston's vehicle. There you go. He's running south, which is towards where the gun is at from the vehicle. As he runs past Officer Langston, that's when the gunshot, the gunshots start going out. <clears throat> as soon as the guns, uh, gunshots start, the suspect makes like an abrupt, almost, almost 90 degree turn. And with the gun still in his hand, he makes a turn to run east, which would be towards, towards the gun again, um, <clears throat> where you see the gun on the screen. And at this time, with the firearm still in his hand now, he's, he's looking at me with the gun still in his hand. That's when uh, I fired several shots from, from my duty weapon at the suspect. Where were you at relative to where he was when you fired? Uh, he, he was, this is, can we go back and, and get one where you can kind of see my car more? Your car? Yeah. <laughs> of like a larger view. Yeah, here you go. Uh, I would, I'm roughly, I'm about right here. I'm, I'm in somewhere in this lane right here. And the suspect would have been right here. So at that point, you had seen the suspect exit the vehicle with this firearm in his hand. You heard a, a single gunshot, and then you saw him do an abrupt turn, correct? Yes. Okay. And then where you were at, where you fired, is approximately where the firearm is located on the ground there, right? Roughly? Mm, no. I, I'm, I'm, more, I'm more almost straight out the driver's door of my okay. car. And when he was, you said he, he turned and looked at you, he had the firearm in his hand, and he, he looked at you, and at that point, you fired? Yes. Why did you fire? Uh, I feared that without uh, eliminating the threat, that he was a threat to the life of both myself and Officer Langston. Why did you think he was a threat to you or Officer Langston? Uh, based on his, based on the behavior of the suspect, uh, kidnapping and carjacking suspect, and he's he's still armed, still has the firearm in his hand. So the fact that he still had a firearm in his hand. Yes. And at this point, did you have any reason to doubt? that he had committed the violent act of kidnapping? Had any information been given to you or given over the radio uh, to dispute that initial claim by the victim? No, sir. Okay. Does that conclude your, your timeline of testimony? Uh, after, after the suspect went down, um, I maintained lethal cover on the suspect. Officer Langston ran back to the suspect vehicle, cleared the vehicle, verified there were no further suspects or victims inside the vehicle. Um, he, when he was done, he also uh, grabbed a medical kit. We provided uh, medical until other officers could get on scene and rescue could get on scene. And as other officers rolled up, myself and Officer Langston both directed officers what to do, block traffic, um, get us gloves, and I had an officer stay with the gun as well. How many times did you fire? Eight. Okay. Obviously, that happened in a very, very tight time frame, a tight window. Sure. But we're responsible for every round that we fire. Did every round go where you intended it to go? Yes, sir. And was the same justification present for round six, seven, and eight as it was for the first one when it comes to when it came to your justification for using deadly force? Yes, sir. We'll take a little a step back here to the description of the suspect that you received. What was the description of the suspect that you received? It was a light-skinned black male wearing a red shirt and a camouflage bandana. Okay. Did the suspect match that description that you received, or was there any, any, any difference uh, from the way the suspect actually was in the description that was given? Yes, sir, there was. Okay. What was the difference? 
it was not a light skinned black male, it was a white male. Okay. And the, the, he was not, he was no longer wearing the camouflage bandana. Right. Was there any doubt, however, when you saw this suspect exit that vehicle that that suspect, though not exactly like the description that you read, was there any doubt that that was the suspect of the, of the crime of kidnapping? At the time, I didn't know. Okay. <coughs> but the, the suspicion that he had committed kidnapping coupled with the fact that he had the firearm in his hand is why you're saying you, you fired? That is, that, that's correct, sir. Yes, time. because it was, it was a very, it's a, it's a short time lapse. Um, it's a short time lapse. He's wearing a red shirt. He's the only person inside of the carjacking kidnapping vehicle and he jumps out with a firearm in his hand. Was he pointing the firearm at you when you fired? He was, it was pointed in my direction because when he turned around and faced me, it's in his hand. He, okay. did, he didn't extend the arms. Did it need to be pointing right at you for you to fire? No, sir, it didn't. Well, walk me through why it didn't need to be pointing right directly at you for you to fire. And, and, and when, I, when I say walk me through that, as far as your understanding of the, uh, the rules of engagement when it comes to our training and, and how we've been taught. Um, <clears throat> in that case, sir, it would be... If I, if I waited for the suspect to point the firearm at me, it would be reactive instead of proactive, meaning that if I wait for the suspect to point the firearm directly at me and start pulling the trigger, if his first round is better than my first round, I'm dead. Okay. Do me a favor. Take the microphone put it closer to your mouth, please. We'll make sure that the sound isn't too loud. We need to speak into that so that we pick it up on the recording. How long have you worked with Officer Langston prior to this incident? How long had you worked with Officer Langston? Myself and Officer Langston went to the police academy together. We sat beside each other in the police academy uh, in 2013. He went to, he got hired a couple months before I did. Uh, we worked zone five midnights in patrol together, and we were also on the community problem response unit together. Okay. There were brief periods overlapping there where, where we weren't working side by side. Prior to turning on your emergency lights, had there been any discussion with Officer Langston over the radio or over Bravo frequency or anything about what you were going to do if you did contact the suspect? No, sir. Okay. Had you worked with him enough to know that if you get into a situation, uh, there were going to be certain actions he would take relative to yours? Yes, sir. Okay. So you pulled behind the suspect vehicle. What did you perceive happening as he drove right past you? I knew, I knew he was going to block the vehicle. Okay. Had you conducted any blocks before? Yes, we had. Okay. Walk me through what blocking a vehicle really entails and, and what the purpose of that is. Uh, the purpose of blocking a vehicle, especially in this case, is because if, if we don't block the vehicle in this case, uh, it, it could create a very... Before you tell me why you blocked the vehicle, tell me what blocking is as far as you understand it. The blocking is parking two police vehicles so that a suspect vehicle cannot cannot move. So it's the placement of two vehicles or placement of one vehicle uh, along with a stationary object to prevent a civilian vehicle or suspect vehicle from being able to break free. Is that what, is that what, you, what you guys were doing? Yes, sir. Why did you want to block the vehicle? Why did you need to prevent this person from fleeing, especially in the light of the fact that the victim had been recovered? Uh, given given the, the suspect's previous actions, um, I have no doubt that this would have ended up in a very high-speed pursuit and easily could have hurt other innocent citizens. Had you chosen, however, to disengage and not pursue the suspect, what could or could there have been any potential fallout by you letting the suspect go? Absolutely. Further carjackings, kidnappings. So the threat of potentially lethal uh, violence or great bodily harm to other individuals? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Okay. I have no further questions. Lieutenant Alicia. So when you when you blocked the suspect vehicle, <clears throat> did he his actions he reversed back and was trying to move forward or trying to back up to try to escape? I think what he was trying to do was create space. The the space was already tight initially when Officer Langston positioned his vehicle because there there were I'm, I don't know if the the first vehicle had turned off, but there was. There was a small area between the civilian vehicle and the suspect vehicle. Um, so Officer Langston, it, he tightly fits his vehicle in there the best that, the best that he, I, I would say that he could. And so your actions were then to place your vehicle and push his vehicle up against his? Well, when he, 
when he reverses, he leaves a little bit of space, but then when he goes back into drive, and, and you can see where his vehicle landed against Officer Langston's, I, I actually put my push bumper into the rear of the vehicle and hit the emergency brake and put it in park. That way, there's no more space for him to break free at that point. Yeah, thank you. No more questions. This is Chief Smith. I have one question. Yes, there was discussion reference black male, white male, but based on what you had, did it matter what the race was when he had a gun? No, ma'am, it sure didn't. Thank you. Again, I just do a follow-up, Assistant Chief Smith. I'd like you to word why it did not matter. Why, why, though it clearly, it was clear to you that this suspect didn't match the exact description, and you did indicate there were some similarities. Why did it not matter that there was some disparity in the description and what you were seeing in front of you? Uh, because, because the suspect, when he got out of the vehicle, was still armed and posed an immediate threat to myself and Officer okay. Langston. Thank you. This is Chief Short. Did you use any illumination um, from your pistol or your spotlight or anything? I, I don't remember. I don't remember. If, I don't remember if my spot the spotlight was on. I know my um, my overhead lights were on. Okay, so it happened very quickly. You know, being almost nine o'clock at night, how was it light enough for you to see the firearm and and that type of stuff? Background lighting. Okay, so there was sufficient lighting. Yes, sir. There. Did you I'm, give? I'm not sure if it was street lights or uh, lights on the side of businesses, but there was there was plenty of background okay. lighting. Did you give the suspect any verbal commands? No, sir, I did not. Why not? I didn't think it was feasible. I didn't think I had time. Did, can you describe your backstop, um, particularly any citizens in the area driving by? No, sir. Um, when this happened, the can we go to the area? My backdrop is going to be a closed business. I was already familiar with the area. I've worked laying in San Juan area multiple times. Um, and no, sir, there was no other traffic on the roadway. From, from where I was firing, this would have been my backstop right here. There was no traffic uh, coming eastbound on San Juan behind me. Behind myself and Officer Langston, there was no more traffic. Okay. Were you? I know you mentioned initially you were aware of your partner's position. Were you aware of his position the entire time that you were shooting? Yes, sir. And then lastly, you mentioned. Uh, I'm sorry, two more. Um, why did you stop shooting at eight rounds? Why not nine? Why not ten? The su the suspect eventually he fell to the ground and he was just sitting there. And so that's why you stopped shooting. Yes, sir. And then lastly, you mentioned you guys gave medical. Can you describe that? Uh, yes, sir. We. We ran up to him after Officer Langston had cleared the vehicle and grabbed the medical kit. Uh, we took took his shirt off to assess what we had and make sure also make sure that there were no further weapons. The gun at this point was not in reach. Um, and we, we actually started CPR until rescue got there. Okay. Thank you. Okay, two follow-ups. All right, so in response to Assistant Chief Short's question as to why you didn't give verbal commands, you said that you did not think it was feasible. Yes, sir. Did you put together a series of thoughts during all of this and running through your head, I just don't think that I should be giving a warning right now, or did it in fact occur so quickly that you didn't even have a chance to consider that? I want you to walk me through, did you actually go through this, this line of thinking, or did was it truly not feasible? Did you think it was not feasible that night, or was it not feasible that night? It happened so quick that it never it never even went through my head. Got it. So this, probably you didn't think it was feasible. It just, in fact, was not feasible given the tight window that all this happened in. Yes, sir. Seconds, if that. You mentioned that you stopped shooting when he fell to the ground. Can a suspect continue to be a threat when he's on the ground? Yes, he can. Okay. So was it just because he fell to the ground that you stopped shooting? He fell to the ground, and at this point he was no longer moving. And I took a second. I, I pulled back my firearm. Mm -hmm. And I, I scanned the area, and I saw the firearm was with, not within arm's reach at this point. And so the suspect at that point was no longer a threat, and that's why he stopped shooting. He no longer had the original firearm that I saw in his hand. I could verify that that was the one that was on the street. Okay. Director Hattie. The 
the testimony is that somebody was on the phone with OnStar? Yes, sir. Did anybody report to you that, that OnStar had lost contact with the vehicle at any given time during that? No, sir. It was from the time that we actually heard that OnStar was tracking until when we found the vehicle was a very small window. This is only probably, I don't want to give wrong information, but I would say two to three minutes. And initially it was stationary, sir, so it, the vehicle wasn't moving when it was first um, located. Gotcha. The, um, what color shirt did the suspect have on when he got out of the car? Red, sir. Okay, and that matched the description of the call from my recollection, is that correct? Yes, sir, it did. Okay. How did you know that wasn't another victim in the car that was trying to escape his kidnapper? It's based, the only way, the only way I know how to answer is that is that at, at the time, um, I didn't have any other information that led me to believe that there was another victim. Okay. It was the call that only one victim had been kidnapped? Yes, sir, and I was aware that she'd been let out of the vehicle. Okay, so there wasn't any, any, any other information that you had. Did that thought somewhere go to you that there shouldn't be anybody else in the car? Yes, sir. That should only be the suspect? Yes, sir. Was that lighting that you had that was light from the other buildings, do you think you could have differentiated the fact that he was a white male or a light-skinned black male in the, in the brief time that you had to eyeball him? Honestly, sir, I don't, I don't remember. Okay. When you fired your, your gun, did you know uh, Langston's location? Yes, I did. Okay, so you knew? I knew the suspect had cleared Officer Langston. Okay, okay I'll have you further. Okay, so this concludes the questioning for you. However, we may need some further clarification. So what we're going to have you do is return to your seat. We're going to have Officer Langston come take your place, okay? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. I've been saying good morning, but it's actually good afternoon. So good afternoon, sir. If you could just state your name, ID number, your current assignment, and the, the assignment you had on the night of this incident. Yes, sir. My name is Officer B.J. Langston, ID number 73721. I'm currently assigned to the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office K-9 Unit Red Squad. Uh, on the date of the incident, though, sir, I was assigned to the Community Problem Response Unit Red Squad. Okay. So just like we did with Officer Jester, I'm going to ask that you describe your involvement in this incident from the moment you were notified about this call involving a kidnapping suspect all the way up into your discharge of your firearm. Uh, but I'm going to ask that you not give any additional details that you didn't yourself experience that night. So and it's a little harder for somebody that testifies after a, a principal member. Um, I don't need to know anything that maybe was related to you or maybe that you just heard from Officer Jester. But from your perspective alone, just walk us through the series of events uh, from your perspective, okay? Yes, sir. Thanks. On August 14, 2017, at 2050, uh, 8.50 p.m., uh, I was sitting at the CPRU office, the Community Problem Response Unit office at 1591 Lane Avenue, when I was alerted by a teammate, Officer F.G. Wise, um, via our closed OSS channel, our Bravo 13 channel, that uh, Zone 4 patrol units were, were tracking uh, a vehicle that was taken during an armed kidnapping and armed carjacking. Um, Immediately after I heard that, sir, I, I, Officer Jester and I were sitting in the office next to each other. We walked downstairs to our patrol vehicles. I grabbed my laptop and I began skimming uh, our mobile data computers to, to try to ascertain information about the call. Uh, the information that I had was that it was a, the suspect vehicle was a 2017 white Chevrolet Impala with the uh, Florida State specialty tag attached to it. it and. Um, we began listening to the Alpha 4, the Zone 4 radio channel, and we were hearing updates provided by Zone 4 officers as to the location of the vehicle. Uh, the vehicle is currently being tracked by OnStar. 
As, as we're listening to the vehicles updated locations, Officer Jester and I aren't far. I believe we were about a mile, a uh, mile and a half away from the location where the vehicle was being tracked. Uh, we began driving in that direction, south on Lane Avenue, from 1591 Lane Avenue. We're driving, Officer Jester's in his marked patrol vehicle in front of me. Um, I'm driving behind him. As we approach the intersection of Lane Avenue and San Juan Avenue, uh, the advised vehicle was stationary at, at San Juan and Nivlik, which was just further uh, east of where we're, just further east of where we were at Lane and San Juan. Um, as we approached the intersection, um, they, uh, it, they told us that the uh, Zone 4 officers told us that the vehicle was actually moving westbound on San Juan Avenue toward our location. As J Officer Jester and I approached the intersection of San Juan Avenue and Lane Avenue, uh, we saw the vehicle. Um, Officer Jester was in front of me. I was behind him. The vehicle. Uh, use a pointer here. The vehicle was traveling uh, westbound on San Juan Avenue. Um, Officer Jester and I were here, as you saw in the surveillance video. We were continuing eastbound as we saw the vehicle, and I observed the uh, Florida State Specialty tag attached to the vehicle. Um, I alerted other officers via radio that we had the uh, vehicle in sight. Uh, immediately which afterward, Officer Jester performed a U-turn. I performed a U-turn behind him. Um, I saw that he went to the rear of the vehicle, setting the rear, the rear portion of the vehicle block, and I proceeded to the front of the vehicle and um, set the forward portion of a vehicle block. Um, unfortunately, I w a good vehicle block calls for bumper-to-bumper -bumper contact um, per our general orders and op operations orders. I did, was not afforded that luxury because of there being uh, heavy congested traffic right here. There was actually two cars waiting to go at the red light. So I drove my patrol car in between the suspect vehicle and the civilian vehicle in front of it, placing my passenger side directly against the suspect vehicle uh, front bumper. Um, after the vehicle block was set, uh, prior to the vehicle block being set, I activated my emergency lights to, to let the suspect know that we were the police and we were attempting to conduct a vehicle stop or vehicle block. Um, immediately after I set the block, uh, or we had set the block, I um, exited my patrol vehicle from the driver's door. I began running wide. I began running wide, and uh, my plan was to initially run wide and then get back to Officer Jester's vehicle so that we could do a possible vehicle assault um, because it was I at the time I did not know that the hostage was not in the vehicle. So I. I'm I, sorry. Can you say that again? You you plan to do a what? Uh, possible uh, either a vehicle assault if there was a hostage inside of the vehicle or a high-risk uh, traffic stop. I was trying to get out of the line of fire so that we could set up a high-risk traffic stop after following the vehicle block. Okay, walk me through a, what a vehicle assault is, please. Yes, sir. Um, I've had uh, there's there's been training that I've had before in the in the military and then briefly um, with the sheriff's office where um, after a vehicle block is set, if we needed to, I would walk up to the uh, we would we would move as a, as an as an apprehension team move up to the suspect vehicle to uh, get the suspect out if possible. Um, the main goal of that being that he would not be able to harm the uh, hostage where she's still in the car. Um, but before before we were going to do any of that, sir, I was going to get back to Officer Jester's vehicle and we were going to come up with a tactical plan. Um, the, once the vehicle was immobilized, I, I think the bet we were probably going to go with a high risk traffic stop. Okay, I'll save a couple questions for the end. Good. Yes, sir. Um, so after the, excuse me, after the, um, as, as I began to run, as I began to run out wide and go back towards Officer Jester's car, um, I saw the dome light from the 2017 Chevrolet Impala, the suspect vehicle, uh, activate, uh, meaning that someone had opened a vehicle door. Uh, based on that, I stopped at the, uh, I stopped at my trunk for cover. Go back to that. Right there. Uh, so I stopped here at my trunk, at the back of my trunk, for for cover and concealment, um, while I started ye yelling out to the suspect, "Show me your hands! Show me your hands!" I said this two to three times, uh, at which I, I saw no reaction from the suspect, no attempt to show me his hands at all. The suspect responded by opening the driver's door, and he began to run uh, south al south across Lane Avenue. Can we go back to the uh, overhead view? Uh, uh, uh. Uh, can we go several slides back, please, where it shows all, all three vehicles in the road? There we go. <laughs> Suspect began running wide um, away from his vehicle south along Lane Avenue. 
And if I could, I'd like to demonstrate using a blue gun um, suspect's actions. So as the suspect exited his vehicle, uh, this table is a suspect vehicle, um, and I'm roughly positioned where I was seated there. The suspect exits his vehicle, exits his vehicle as I'm, and I see him begin to run. He's got a uh, firearm in his right hand, and using the discrimination process, I can see he's wearing a red T-shirt, the same as the suspect description that was uh, that was uh, put up over the over the radio. And I, he begins to run, and as he runs, I see the extended magazine protruding from the pistol. Um, at which point I said, drop the gun, drop the gun. The suspect responded by pointing the firearm at me, and he continued running. At which point I began shooting at the suspect after he had cleared the space between Officer Jester and I. Okay, so you began shooting. How many times did you fire? Nine times, sir. And did you do all nine at once? No, sir. There was two separate volleys. Okay, and the first volley included how many? Yes, sir. The first volley uh, was, was five rounds. Um, if I can, sir, I'll sit back down. Yes, yeah, sure. yes, sir. Good. Okay. So as not to interrupt your, your train of thought here, I'll let you, let you continue and I'll ask a few questions. Yes, sir. Go ahead. The, uh, I fired my initial volley once the suspect cleared the space between Officer Jester and I. Um, can we go back to the slide of an over of an aerial view? Right there, that one's good. Um, as the suspect began running south along Lane Avenue, I observed this closed business, two-story concrete building as my backstop. Um, I began engaging the suspect after he pointed the firearm at me and cleared the space between Officer Jester and I. Uh, I fired a volley of five rounds, and after the suspect uh, continued running, afterward the suspect continued running south and did an, a 90 degree turn back toward the east. It appeared to me a 90 degree turn, started running back in the direction of Officer Jester. Um, Officer Jester was nowhere in my line of fire, so after the suspect conducted the 90 degree turn, I then engaged him again with another volley of rounds um, because I saw he was running in the direction of Officer Jester with his firearm up still. Um, afterward, the suspect collapsed onto the pavement, and um, I, I, I began I began to tactically communicate with Officer Jester. Um, we, he he was going he he covered the suspect with lethal cover, maintained lethal cover. I turned around and checked the vehicle, looking for additional suspects or the hostage to see if there was she was still in the car. Um, at that point, I, I saw no one else in the car. I got on the radio and advised uh, that Officer Jester and I had just shot a suspect, and I called for rescue. I conducted a tactical reload on my pistol, and um, then I ran to my vehicle, my patrol vehicle, to get my first aid kit. I grabbed my first aid kit and returned back. Officer Jester and I moved together um, toward the suspect. We um, searched, you know, immediately we searched the suspect to verify that he had no additional weapons on him. And then uh, at that point, I, I saw the suspect was gasping for air, which is, uh, based on my training experience, he was suffering tension pneumothorax, uh, collapsed lung. Um, at which point, I, Officer Jester and I pulled his shirt off, and uh, I began uh, trying to patch the, uh, the holes in his chest, the sucking chest wounds, using occlusive dressings. Um, unfortunately, once I pulled his shirt off, I saw there were too many. I did not have enough occlusive dressings um, to patch all the holes in his chest. So at that point, we began um, dressing them as best we could. Um, I wasn't necessarily worried about the bleeding to the extremities. I was that was first first focus on treating the sucking chest wound. Uh, a short time later, rescue arrived, and I told them what what had happened that he had been shot. I believe he had a sucking chest wound, and rescue arrived and loaded the loaded the suspect up, and they went off to the hospital. Okay. So the first volley of, of shots, which is it was five, that was when he was running away from you and the firearm was pointed at you? Yes, sir, as he continued running. Okay. Walk me through uh, Officer Jester's position there and what what your backstop was, what considerations you gave to, to ensure that your rounds went where, where you intended them to yes, go. Yes, sir. Uh, so I'll, I was at the back of my vehicle here. Um, I had actually stepped out into the roadway uh, right here about where these uh, these directional arrows are. Officer Jester was standing adjacent to his driver's door. Um, the suspect began running south, and as the suspect cleared here, um, probably about the far south side of this middle lane is where I began engaging him. Um, I, be, I engaged him 
once once I was able to look at the suspect and identify that Officer Jester was not in the backdrop and that the backdrop was a closed concrete built a closed business in a concrete building, that's when I began engaging the suspect. And then relative to Officer Jester's engagement, when did your second volley of, of shots come and what was the position of the suspect at that point? Immediately after the 90 degree turn where I saw the suspect, uh, I actually thought my rounds were ineffective that I had missed. And uh, immediately after the, the 90 degree turn um, that the suspect made running back towards this direction, east on um, east on San Juan Avenue. Immediately after the 90 degree turn, that's where I engaged the suspect with the second round of volleys as he, appro as he began running toward Officer Jester. So why did you shoot the second series of, of shots? I fired a second series of shots because I felt that my first rounds were ineffective um, because the suspect was continuing to move, running away from me, and um, he was running toward Officer Jester. I was in fear not only for my life but for Officer Jester as well at that point because the suspect appeared to be aiming his firearm at Officer Jester. So the suspect appeared to have his firearm and was headed towards your other officer? Yes, sir. But to be clear, Officer Jester was not in the background. He was to the side. Correct. Based yes, on sir. your position. Yes, sir. You said you tactically communicated. You essentially had him take cover. That way you could do a scan to see if there's any additional threat. Is that what you were? Yes, sir. To? Okay. So when you, prior to conducting what I guess what we'd call a traffic stop uh, or the, the vehicle block, is there enough time to formulate any sort of plan on the radio? No, sir. Uh, I would I would estimate that the time that we heard that Zone 4 was tracking the vehicle to the time that we were actually on scene with the vehicle was, I would say, significant, probably a minute, minute and a half. Um, there was we were not trying to get on the radio to interrupt the uh, the flow the flow of information that was coming from the Zone 4 officer, but we had we did not communicate about conducting a block prior to actually doing it. Okay, Officer Jester testified that you had worked together. Uh, do you concur that? the two of you had worked together sufficiently enough that even if there was not any explicit communication that you had an idea of where the, what the other was going to do? Yes, sir. Um, Officer Jester and I, being on the community problem response unit together, have conducted numerous traffic uh, vehicle blocks and, vehicle tra and, and high risk traffic stops together prior to this uh, incident. Okay. And we talked about what a vehicle block is for and Officer Jester explained that it's to prevent the suspect from, from from being able to drive away. Why was a vehicle block needed? A vehicle block was needed to prevent a uh, pursuit. Um, as we continue, if we can go back to the overview, right there, as we as, as the suspect was, was in the lane to turn north on the Lane Avenue, that's a highly residential area as you continue north in the Lane Avenue. Um, my thought was we needed to prevent a vehicle pursuit in which a hostage would possibly be involved and um, to also prevent a high-speed vehicle pursuit to endanger, you know, to prevent the suspect from endangering anyone else on the roadway. So prior to the attempted vehicle block, you did not know whether or not there was a potential victim in the vehicle? I did not know, sir. And so your thought in conducting the block was to prevent a pursuit? Is that the only reason you conducted a, a vehicle block? Well, no, no, sir. I didn't want, if there was a hostage in the vehicle, I did not want the suspect to escape with a hostage in the vehicle because then he could have possibly harmed her further. Okay, and if there is no hostage in the vehicle, would you still conduct a vehicle block? Yes, sir. Why? Uh, to prevent uh, the suspect from threatening and, and causing, from threatening people on the roadway, innocent civilians on the roadway. On the roadway or anywhere else? Yes, sir. At this point, did you have any reason to believe that he had not committed the, the, the felony act of kidnapping, <laughs> the violent felony? At, when we conducted the vehicle block, no, sir. I, I believe that the suspect was still driving the vehicle, um, and at that point, uh, and after he exited the vehicle, I was, I was, I had reasonable, I had probable cause to believe that the suspect was the same individual that committed the crime, or excuse me, reasonable suspicion, um, based on his clothing that he was wearing, based on he still had a firearm in his hand, and then my reasonable suspicion was compounded um, once he actually pointed the firearm at me. Of course, but before we get to that, because clearly once he's pointing the firearm at you, there's no dispute that you had justification to use deadly force, at least for me. But what, before we get there, when you conducted the vehicle block, obviously your position was that front position where you're attempting to make contact with the vehicle uh, so that he, he or she, whoever's driving the vehicle, has no possible way of getting, you know, getting away. You knew at that point that it was highly likely the driver was an armed suspect. What considerations for your officer safety were given when you drove right up to the front of the vehicle to conduct the block? 
Well, sir, I, I'm trying to maintain the best officer safety as I could. Um, that's why as soon as I hit the vehicle block, uh, or excuse me, as soon as we set the vehicle block, I, I got out of my car as quickly as possible to get behind some cover. Um, in the meantime, I, I had no cover. I had concealment. I was very close to the suspect, but my thoughts were toward rescuing a possible hostage instead of, you know, put instead of putting my safety above hers. Okay. So f following the priority of life <coughs> scale, do you know what that is? Yes, sir. Okay. Can you explain that for me? Yes, sir. Uh, the priority of life scale, uh, it, it indicates our priority of life as law enforcement officers at the very top is innocent civilians, um, followed by uh, fellow law enforcement officers, first responders, um, and then below that we have uh, a suspect. So if, if there had been 100% confirmation that only the suspect were in the vehicle, would you have handled the situation differently? No, sir. I still, I still would have. Being that there wouldn't be a victim, and, and I know I'm walking you through a hypothetical here, but I'm, I'm trying to get to the, the whole reason why this vehicle block was used, okay? So you just walked through the priority of life matrix, right, or, or, or scale. Victims or innocent bystanders are at the top, and who's number two? Uh, first responders. Okay. And so if uh, I give you a scenario very similar to what you ran through, and there is no victim in the vehicle, uh, placing yourself in front of an armed suspect uh, would probably not be the first go-to, correct? I, I would still have. That's not a trick question. Oh, sir, I would still have executed the vehicle block based on the fact that we were trying to prevent a high speed vehicle pursuit. It's not ideal. I wouldn't, ideally, no, sir, I would not have placed myself in front of an okay. armed suspect. Right. But in, in, in retrospect, thinking or, or looking at the totality of the right. circumstances, I, I, my priority was to make sure that no harm came to the hostage and no harm came to the, the public on the roadway or anyone around who could have been harmed by a vehicle pursuit. And so that leads me to, you did not know that there was no victim in the vehicle at the time, and it's, it's reasonable that you don't have all of the information. And so with the potential that there is a victim, that's where we're looking at that top step of that priority of life scale, correct? Yes, sir. All right, so you pulled up, you are potentially in a place where it, there is no cover between you and the suspect. Um, you stopped your vehicle, you exited your vehicle, and then you say you ran to the back of Officer Jester's vehicle, or that was the in, intended uh, path? Yes, sir. That was the intended path. To, the intended path. And you said you were going to do that so that you could work through a plan on how to perhaps extract a suspect or conduct a high-risk traffic stop? Yes, sir. Okay. But you didn't get to that point because the suspect exited the vehicle and, as you testified, was pointing the gun at you. Yes, sir. And you fired at him because... I fired my weapon at him because he had pointed a firearm at me after having just committed a violent, forcible felony, and I was in fear for my life. Got it. No further questions, Lieutenant Alicia? No further questions. Assistant Chief Smith? Yep, one question. Have you been trained in a blocking technique? Yes, ma'am. I've taken three, well, I was, I've taken three classes offered by the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office in uh, vehicle blocks. Thank you. Assistant Chief Short. Um, I feel like you're unnecessarily selling yourself short on the lack of cover. Based on my training experience, the vehicle does provide some cover, especially the engine block. Are you familiar with that? Yes, sir. Okay, so you did have some cover from your police vehicle. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and if I'm wrong on that, the training academy can correct me when they get a chance. Um, you mentioned you've been trained in the vehicle assault. Can you tell me who did that training for you? Uh, yes, sir. I was trained in the United States Army um, when I was there doing vehicle assaults. Uh, it, it, we were trained on that, and I also conducted one training class with the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office SWAT team on, on vehicle assaults. So you were trained by the our Sheriff's Office SWAT team on how to do a vehicle assault? Yes, sir. It was a brief class that I attended, and um, I, w that was a class that I went through um, when I was a, uh, a, pr uh, a prospective candidate on the uh, Jacksonville Sheriff's Office SWAT team. Okay. You mentioned the discrimination process. Can you describe that? Yes, sir. It's a uh, whole body, hands, waistline, immediate area, and the uh, suspect demeanor. Okay, and so using that process, how, do he, how does it apply to this suspect? Yes, sir. So when I first uh, saw the suspect, I looked at his whole body. I observed he was wearing the same clothing as was listed in the suspect description, or it was put out over the radio. Um, upon a further scan, I saw that he did have a firearm in his hand with an extended magazine. Um, his waistline, I, I wasn't focused on that after I saw the firearm. Um, I did, during my initial whole body scan, verify he wasn't some sort of law enforcement officer. I didn't see a badge or, or anything that said police on it. 
As far as immediate area, I looked at the suspect and in the immediate area, I saw the vehicle. I saw Officer Jester in my ARCA fire on my backstop, and that's why I didn't immediately engage the suspect. I waited until he cleared the roadway. Having all that knowledge known to me from the discrimination, the whole body, excuse me, the discrimination process, I identified that he was probably, he was very likely to be our suspect. I'm not going to say 100% sure, but I had that reasonable suspicion that he was our suspect. I also identified that he was carrying a firearm. He was not a member of law enforcement, and he had pointed a firearm at me, and that's when I engaged him. And then the last step of the process is demeanor. What was his demeanor? His demeanor, sir, his demeanor was that he was fleeing. To me, I mean, he was, he knew he was fleeing our attempt to apprehend him. He immediately jumped out of the car after I identified myself as a policeman using my vehicle, and I was dressed in a tactical vest that said police and had a sheriff's office badge on it. His demeanor was that he was fleeing and he wasn't going back to jail. And when he pointed the firearm at me, he had a look of anger in his eyes. Again, don't sell yourself short on the demeanor, right? The fleeing really is secondary to the fact he's pointing a firearm at you, correct? Yes, sir. So would you consider that to be active physical resistance? Yes, sir, absolutely. And what type of crime is it to point a firearm at a policeman? Well, at the very minimum, I would say it was aggravated assault on a law enforcement officer. Okay, so that would all go under demeanor? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Director Hackney. How, and you may not have an answer, but I'll ask anyway. How did you not know that the victim had been dropped off when your partner knew? Yes, sir. So when we jumped, when we were in our office, sir, I was operating, I had my portable radio only, and I was operating on our closed channel listening to my other teammates. And then as we came down from our office, I was in a hurry to get to my vehicle. I was running to my vehicle. I was flipping my radio to the Zone 4 radio channel, and I pulled up the call notes. All I heard on the Zone 4 radio channel when I turned to it, sir, was a Zone 4 officer providing updates to the vehicle location. I did not know that there was no vehicle, that there was no hostage inside of the car. All I heard was armed kidnapping, armed carjacking, and we're tracking the vehicle. And I was focused on what the vehicle looked like, what the suspect looked like, and their direction of travel. Okay. Did the suspect make any statements to you at any time? No, sir. The shots you fired, were they intentional? Yes, sir. And did your weapon malfunction at any time? It did not malfunction. I don't want any further. Okay. Any other questions from the board? Okay. And with that, we will move to our executive session. I'll turn it to Director Hackney. And actually, Officer Jester, if you'll turn to the table here. All right, guys. So we now move into what we call executive session. And typically, it's for us to have an opportunity to discuss amongst ourselves any thoughts or comments that we may have. We typically won't ask you any questions, but however, we may, based on whatever the discussion needs to be. We'll also seek input from the police academy, the firing range, and the general counsel's office. So that's where we'll go from here. So before we did that, I don't believe I asked you, were your shots intentional? Yes, sir, they were. And did your weapon malfunction? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. That's just housekeeping that needs to be. So if we can, I'm going to start with the firing range to add a statement, and then we'll ask questions and see. No, sir. Everything appeared based on training. Everything was right where it needed to be. And to elaborate on that, we have a suspect that allegedly committed a violent felony, but more so is pointing a firearm at a police officer. That in and of itself, in any scenario that you've taught at the firing range, would justify the use of deadly force by our law enforcement officers? Yes, it is. Okay, thanks. Any thoughts for the range? Okay, let's get over to the academy. Anything in reference to training that you see? No, sir. Both officers followed training as per the academy. All right, so let's walk through the vehicle block, and obviously its purpose is to prevent a vehicle from leaving. Is it unreasonable that a vehicle block, even if it is performed by 
officers that have done it many times. Is it unreasonable that perhaps it didn't get executed correctly? Is that necessarily commentary on their lack of, uh, of ability or, or, or it say anything negative about them, or is it just given the, uh, the nature of these types of uh, escalating events that it could very well not be executed properly and the officers still did the best that they could? Yes, sir. In uh, real-world situations, uh, that does occur. Officer Langston, with the, with the opportunity he was given, I was discussing that with Sergeant Fillingham, uh, conducted the block as, a, as a effectively as he could at the time. Thanks, sir. And it's not given that, that a vehicle can, can pull out of or, or escape from that just because of that it wasn't executed textbook-wise, you know, with one vehicle directly placed in front. Um, but well, you still officer, are... With it, Officer Jester's uh, uh, movement of the vehicle, uh, pushing forward with the vehicle, mm -hmm. that seemed to have corrected any any gaps that might have let the suspect escape. Right. Anybody else? So just, just to clarify, any gap or any space left without bumper to bumper contact or contact on both of the uh, areas, that would provide an opportunity. So the front bumper being pushed up against the side of the vehicle with the rear vehicle pushed up against that bumper would prevent the opportunity for an escape or better, a higher probability of lack of escape. Yes, sir. Okay. That's all. All right, and uh, seeking information from the general counsel's office. Okay. I have no comments. Um, just for, for y'all's sake, so you know, um, we spoke about it before we started or as we started. Um, the board makes a recommendation to the sheriff, and we take him from the information that we have here, um, take that forward to the sheriff, and he makes the decision. The decision that he makes is final. Ours is just a recommendation to him. Um, once he makes that recommendation, it comes back to y'all through your chain of command so you know what, what he's uh, finally decided. Uh, but also, just so you know what we'll do for, for each of y'all, we will ask three questions of the board, and those questions are, was the member's use of force within departmental policy, and we'll answer yes or no. Does the member need any additional situational training? Again, we'll answer yes or no. And should this case be referred to internal affairs for any further investigation, we'll uh, yes or no and, and re related comments to that. So we'll, we'll ask both of those, or all three of those questions for both of y'all. Um, tally that information and we'll send that to the to the sheriff's office so comments from the board anybody want to discuss anything? yeah i was just gonna uh hit two little points um number one there was a lot of discussion about was it a black male or a white male or a light-skinned black male um you know i think it's important for us to remember that although especially officer jester wasn't positive that he was the kidnapping suspect um you know using the discrimination process they both hit the three big ones out of the five, being the whole body, that he matched the description of the suspect. I mean, they would never know for sure it was a suspect until after the investigation is complete. But using the whole body he matched, looking at his hands, secondly, he was armed, and then uh, skipping the waistline and immediate surrounding area, you go to demeanor with the active physical, physical resistance and the aggravated assault on the law enforcement officer, um, I think it's a greater factor in the use of deadly force than whether or not he perfectly matched the race given by different witnesses on a dark night. Um, and another point I was going to mention, um, you know, Officer Jester not giving a verbal warning um, is not a policy violation. He's not required to give a verbal warning. It's only um, to be used when feasible. And separate from that, his partner officer was given verbal warnings. Yeah. yeah. And so the point that, and obviously I was, the line of questioning there, to me, it was very clear. I looked at all these reports, and, and, and before even questioning you, I knew the actions of the suspect. And uh, there's no requirement that you give a verbal warning. Uh, but if you're explaining that you didn't think it would be feasible, you, you weren't thinking it would be feasible, that lends one to believe that perhaps you were thinking about it. But I would argue, based on your testimony, based on what we know to be the timeline, there really wouldn't need time to think about it anyway, right? So you had one officer already giving verbal warnings. At that point, he's pointing a firearm, and uh, you know, you testify that you were in fear for your life. And so the use of that deadly force, I see that as obviously perfectly justified. Um, and when it comes to preventing the escape of, the, uh, of, of this suspect, we already know everything that you have up to this point has confirmed this as the suspect. Regardless uh, of any other any other detail, you know that that was the vehicle that, that, that was involved in a kidnapping. 
So block the vehicle is absolutely something that you want to do because you don't want him to get away. I get that part. And, it, and obviously when he's getting out of the vehicle, sure, maybe, you know, the, the, uh, the race didn't match if you could have even told that on a dark night. But the fact that he's clearly not a police officer and he's pointing a firearm at you, well, that right there. He's committing an aggravated assault on a law enforcement officer, but it's much more than just the crime. It's the fact that he, in that moment, is a threat to your life. So there, there, there's no question that the, the use of deadly force that night by both of you was justified. Yeah. Even if, let's just say that you had grabbed the wrong 2017 um, Impala and you blocked in the wrong car and the wrong guy, um, and just by happenstance, the driver of that car gets out and points that pistol at you, you know, the, just, just that alone, take, take the, the forcible felonies and the, and the threat to the general public because, you know, that suspect kidnapped a, a, a child, minding her own business, you know, all, all those other factors that, that we now know. But even if, even if y'all were wrong, even if you said, oh, I, again, the wrong car, uh, it was the actions of that suspect as he got out of that car, that, that's enough then you just start adding layers of compounding uh, justification onto it. But that that's enough. That's enough for you, and that's enough for you to see that and know that, the, that both of those factors are there. So, absolutely. Yep. Any other comments, Thoughts? No. Okay. So uh, we're going to vote. We're going to go through those questions that we had or that I told you about before. So we'll, uh, so we'll start with Officer Jester. And the three questions I have for the board is, um, was the member's use of force within departmental policy? And I'm going to start to my far right and come back uh, to me last. Yes, it was. Yes. 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 I also vote yes. Does a member need any additional situational training? No, he does not. No. 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 I also vote no. And should this case be referred to internal affairs for any further investigation? No, it should not. No. 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 I also vote no. Moving on to Officer Langston. Was the member's use of force within departmental policy? Yes, it was. Yes. 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 I also vote yes. Should this case be referred to, uh, I'm sorry, does the member need any additional situational training? No, he does not. No. 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 I also vote no. Should this case be referred to internal affairs for any further investigation? No, it should not. No. 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 I also vote no. So, uh, so you've, you've heard how we voted, and again, that information is uh, summed up, given to the sheriff. All this is there for him to review, and once he makes that final decision, like I said, you'll be notified to, to the chain for that. Um, that being said, are there any thoughts or comments, any, any last input that you all want to have? No, sir. Thank you all for, uh, for preparing for today, and uh, that concludes this response to resistance board.